So I remember the first time that my parents left me in charge of my little sister uh, while they went out for dinner. I was about 10 years old. And the night ended with my sister hiding in her bedroom while I played He-Man with a sword that I found in my dad's office, a decorative sword. Uh, and it ended with me stabbing a hole through the drywall in our living room, uh, which brought, prompted my dad to come home and look at me and to say, why did I ever think to leave you in charge? Now, we're working our way through the book of Titus, a book in which Paul uh, leaves a young man named Titus in charge of leadership. Uh, specifically, Titus is supposed to be a leader. But he's also supposed to be developing leaders uh, to help carry out uh, the, the mission of God. Uh, a, a lot of times in the church, we, we tend to shy away from this idea of leadership. Like we're all worried that we're somehow going to turn into you know, self-righteous, arrogant jerks uh, if we're in charge of anything. Uh, but let's just remember that there are times all throughout the scripture and in the world now where God calls some people to the front of the line to help others carry out his mission. I mean, leadership is not an ungodly thing. Uh, and, and if we aren't careful, we'll miss the fact that it's a privilege to have God invite you to help lead his people. So if you're worried that you're going to be arrogant, then just be humble. Uh, if you're worried that you're not prepared, read the Bible. It's full of stories of people who aren't prepared that God used anyways. The point is, let's not just be weird about the idea of leadership. Instead, let's respond to what God is saying. And in this case, what, what Paul uh, tells Titus is that he specifically wants him to carry out the work that Paul has left half done. Uh, Paul is, is leaving, and he wants Titus to continue what he's been doing. And this is the way that leadership works quite often in the church. Uh, we're all part of a bigger story. And God even reveals himself in the Bible this way. He says, and maybe you've heard this, that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That represents three generations of God working through the people of Israel. And you can trace a line from there all the way through the Bible to the work that we are doing now. We're all part of a story um, that, is, that is bigger. And, and what's important to remember is that God isn't constrained by our understandings and our ideas of time. Uh, that's not the, he doesn't feel the pressure to do one thing today and to do another thing tomorrow. And that's important for us to realize because as we're living out our part in God's mission, uh, we have to remember that sometimes uh, we might be starting something. Other times we might be moving into the, the next thing and completing something that God has started a long time ago. The point is, it's not really all about us. A few years ago, there was a device that was created specifically to keep teenagers from loitering in high-end malls in London, and it was called the Mosquito. And what the Mosquito did is it put out a high-frequency pitch that only the teenagers could hear, and so the older people who had money could stay, uh, but the younger people had this ringing in their ears, and they, they took off and left. And it's crazy to think that there could be a device like that, that there could be something that only certain people could hear. But I think the work of God actually works that way in the world. I think sometimes God is only speaking to specific people. And, and this is important for us to understand because we all tend to point fingers at each other, right? The, the older people look at the younger people and go, how are they so entitled? The, the old, younger people look at the older people and go, how are they so old? <laughs> right? And the people like me, middle-aged people, we look at both groups and go, I don't think either one is right. But here's the thing that we've got to remember. God is always speaking. You ready for this? but he's not always speaking to you, at least not in the same way that he's speaking to someone else. I've, I've done youth ministry and worked with teenagers for 20 years, and I am convinced that God is saying a specific thing to the next generation that's different than what he's saying to me. So if you encounter that, if you find someone who seems to be following Jesus, but they're doing it differently than you're doing it, hello, encourage them. Help them along the way, because this is about more than just you. And there's biblical examples of this as well. Um, when David is about to fight Goliath, maybe you remember this, he goes to Saul because he doesn't have any armor. And Saul tries to give him this really big clunky armor that Saul has. And David says, I can't go out in this. It doesn't fit me. Sometimes if we're not careful, that's what we do. We have a specific way that we have experienced God and we try to force that on everyone else. But a better way to respond is, is another Old Testament story when a young man named Samuel was asleep at night and he heard a voice calling to him. And he thought it was his mentor, Eli. So he went to Eli and said, I hear this voice, what should I do? And Eli recognized that it was God and he said, go back and when you hear the voice again, say, speak, Lord, I'm listening. This is the way we should be encouraging each other, the way we should be developing leaders, challenging people to listen to what God is saying to them. And this is what Paul has asked Titus to do. He says, I want you to put a pin in every city on the island of Crete. And I want you to find leaders. I want you to find people who are hearing from God. And then I want you to give them what they need to be able to lead and to be able to carry out the mission of God together in the church. This is the way the church is supposed to work. 
So the question then is, was Titus actually the leader, or was he supposed to find leaders? Well, the answer is yes. He was supposed to do both. He was absolutely supposed to be inviting people into the work and movement of God in the world. But at the same time, he had to make sure that he modeled that same work himself. And this is the way that it it always works. Leadership is an inside-out thing. It starts with what God is doing inside of you and inside of me. And then when God does his work inside of us, we can then turn and share that with other people and equip other people to do the same thing. But this is why what happens inside of us matters so much. Uh, A few years ago, I took my kids and my family to uh, Splash Universe in Dundee. And we'd been a few times before, and my kids were so excited to get on the Lazy River. And so we get there, but it's closed. And we find out from the guy working there, get this, that it's closed because another little kid has pooped in the lazy river. To which my son tearfully exclaims, how can one turd shut down a whole river? (laughs) But the funny thing, to as funny as that is, the thing that we have to remember is we have to remember this. This is why what happens inside of us matters. Because, Because bad stuff inside of us actually can compromise the work that God is trying to do in us and through us. One turd can shut the whole thing down. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we are right on the inside so that we can then lead the way that God wants us to. So, do we want more leaders at Westwinds? Yes, a million times yes. But more than that, we just want faithful followers of Jesus. Because the same things that make you a passionate, faithful follower of Jesus will also make you a good leader. You just have to start with the one to get to the other. So we always work from the inside out. Thanks. Hey, let's talk about girls. Uh, We're going to talk about women in leadership this morning. Paul, when he often gives instructions to the churches about uh, pastors, often uses male pronouns. And he actually has two restricting passages that we'll get to in just a moment that seem to to indicate at first blush that that women can't be pastors or that women can't be preachers. But I think if you'll look at the whole witness of Scripture, you'll find something different. So let's do that right now. Beginning in the New Testament, let's ask the question, what did women actually do? And if we look just at the Bible in the New Testament, Women taught, they taught men, they led, they spoke publicly, they evangelized, they prophesied, and they're listed among apostles, prophets, and elders, the highest ranks of all church leadership. Mary, the mother of Jesus, for example, was the first to receive the information that the Messiah had come. She was also the first to prophesy about the Messiah. And if you compare her prayer, the Magnificat, to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, or the letter of James, who was her other son, you'll you'll find out crazy, crazy, that she actually taught her children about how to follow God. The other Mary that's most famous, Mary Magdalene, who doesn't always cook, but when she does, she spits in it. Instead of doing, quote, unquote, woman's work, came to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn, which meant in that world at that time that she was studying under Jesus to become a rabbi. And she was later called, in fact, by many in the early church, the apostle to the apostles. Priscilla and Aquila were a famous ministerial pair in the book of Acts. Priscilla's name is most frequently mentioned first, showing that she has the uh, the, uh, uh, pride of place. That's the expression I'm looking for. Even here, we see that they taught Apollos, a scholar and expert in the scriptures. So for her to teach a scholar and an expert means she herself was a person of some prominence. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're told that women are permitted to pray and to prophesy in public, including when men are present. And Philip had four daughters who were prophetesses, as well as Anna in the temple. And the thing that you've got to understand about all these terms is that they are terms of authority, that women were leading, and we have evidence of it in the Bible. In Romans chapter 16, Paul tells us about Phoebe, a deacon. The word deacon means prostasis, and Phoebe's specific task was to carry Paul's letters to the church in Rome and then explain those letters to them. And if they misunderstood anything in those letters, she was supposed to set them straight. So she was an expositor and a teacher of the Bible and had authority to correct those who got it wrong. If you look, Paul also lists Junia as somebody being um, outstanding among the apostles. Apostles were the highest rank in the church hierarchy then. So if she's outstanding among the highest rank, there's good evidence with her that anything boys can do, (laughs) yeah, they can. I was on sabbatical earlier this year, and I went to the Santa Priscilla Catacombs in Rome. These date to in the 200s and and have evidence here of of a female pastor in in the early church in the catacomb tradition, which, which again tells us that Women have been doing this stuff since the very beginning. This isn't a modern innovation or some kind of plea to be liberal or whatever. This, this is what the scripture intends. Now, g- given the fact that Paul appointed women, 
commended women, empowered women whenever appropriate, how can we reasonably expect that he also meant to silence women at the same time? Well, the the issue really comes down to two what we call limiting passages, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy 2. But but the question we've got to ask is, are the 8,000 verses of the Bible meant to be interpreted in light of those eight, or or are the eight supposed to fit in within the other 8,000? Um, let's look at them real quick and try and get a sense of the big story. In, in 1 Corinthians 11, for example, we're told that women should remain silent in churches um, un- unless they have a question, which seems like kind of a big if. That, 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 that if seems to rest on an awful lot because, again, what, what, what Paul is demonstrating is like a temporary cultural silence that, that's supposed to best facilitate learning. Again, remember, in that world at that time, Women didn't have the benefits of the same education as men. There was just kind of a lot going on. So Paul, while he elevates women on one hand, also isn't immune to the fact that there's some practical considerations. And when he tells women to, to be quiet, the word that he uses is laleo. It means chatter. So, so what he's really trying to say is, is like, look, keep, keep church services order in, in order. We're, we're trying to pay attention. So don't talk during church, but instead talk after church. And he tells them to do this in, in submission to the law, but, but he doesn't mean the law of Moses, because there's nothing in the law of, of Moses about women needing to be quiet. So the law he's referring to is some cultural law, some conditional law, that again is all supposed to facilitate education and learning at church. The other passage in 1 Timothy 2 starts out by saying this, a woman should learn, which again in that world at that time was revolutionary. Most people weren't saying that. Paul was, and Jesus was. So any uh, silence is temporary, and it's a silence, again, to facilitate learning. And, and the reason this was so important is that there were these, these cults around that time, uh, the new Roman cults, followers of Dionysius and Artemis, uh, had felt that women were subjugated for so long, that now was the time for women to rise up and subjugate men. So whatever perversions men had inflicted, they would now inflict back. And, and this is what Paul is trying to stop. He's saying, look at the, the point is not who gets to be the boss, The point is for us all to cooperate together in the mission of God to heal the world, at home, in the church, and and in society. And before you ever presume to teach, you've got to learn. You've got to understand what it is that you don't know, learn it, and then pass it on to others, which of course to us makes tons of sense. Now, we arrive at all these conclusions, which I realize were blisteringly fast as we present, because we're performing the discipline of historical context. This is the key issue in biblical studies, finding out what this stuff meant then to them over there. Once we got that sorted out, we can apply it to today's context. And one of the big issues you see, especially in Paul's letters, that, that, that helps us sort all this out, is that the idea of male authority comes from Genesis 3 when sin enters the world and we're told that a man will lord his authority over a woman. That, that's a curse. And in no part of the Bible is that curse supposed to be in perpetuity. Jesus renews us and restores us and redeems us. He makes all things new. The curse has been undone. Our chains are broken. And now men and women alike are free to lead together and glorify God as he first intended. Amen? Amen. So you already heard Ben mention that Paul had tasked Titus with the job of selecting church leaders. And Paul is painting a picture here for Titus for selecting and even raising up those church leaders. But before we jump into those qualities, Paul wants us to understand a very important principle, and that is this, that church leaders are managers in the house of God. Now, in the ancient Near East, it was very common for wealthy landowners to hire uh, household managers or stewards to watch over all of their interests. And uh, this would include finances, it would include everything that took place in the household, including sometimes even finding a spouse. And Paul uses this word manager on purpose because he wants us to understand that leadership is stewardship. And Paul has asked Titus to look for leaders that are both accountable and very mindful of themselves and their roles as stewards in the mission of God. So imagine you go away on vacation and you decide decided to hire a house manager to look after your place while you're gone. You give them simple and yet very specific instructions, and then when you return, you find this. Your house sitter has repainted your house with graffiti. You might be a little irritated by that, and that's understandably, because the house sitter failed to measure up to their role. They forgot not only who they were, but they forgot what they were supposed to do. 
And yet, in this situation, we have to ask, how do you measure a good steward or a good house manager? It is one who is always mindful of their role and always keeping in mind whose house it is that they're in. Now, the church is God's house. And we're invited as stewards to look after that which God loves the most, and that's his people. He wants us to love like Jesus, and he wants us to lead like Jesus with the same servant spirit. We are supposed to honor God's house rules, and specifically for pastors. And as we do that, we have to understand that this, this very simple truth. Pastors are not prescribed to be perfect. In fact, they have blemishes, and yet we have to be very careful as followers to not hold our pastors up on a pedestal of perfection because that puts them in a place of falling down, right? We're supposed to hold them accountable and understand that they can be blemished and fallible. But Paul does say this, that a pastor is supposed to lead a blameless life. Now understand that in the Greek, blameless is not equated to perfect. But a pastor is supposed to live without handles, which is what the Greek stands for for blameless, is without handles, which means there's nothing to hold on to in terms of accusation. So how do we live a blameless life? We do self-evaluation. Are there sins in your life that seem insurmountable to you? Are there behaviors or things that you don't want to change? Well, if you want to be a church leader, you have to submit to the type of questioning and accountability that requires you to look over those things and engage in change, because to lead others, you must first engage in leading yourself. And the second thing we do is we have peer evaluation. We need to ask others who see more than we do, do you see anything in my life that is bigger than Jesus? And then when they answer, we need to listen. We need to not be argumentative, we just need to sit and listen and prayerfully consider what it is we hear. The second rule that Paul gives Titus is that church leaders are not to be arrogant or quick-tempered. Now, he purposely groups these two things together because they come from the same root, which is to elevate ourselves above the value of others. And for some reason, arrogance and anger gives us this faulty permission to elevate ourselves behind or above uh, other people. The most arrogant person I know is a guy I'll call Tom. If you spend five minutes with Tom, you'll realize that he thinks pretty highly of himself and he believes he deserves special treatment. You know what happens when Paul gets inconvenienced by other people? He gets angry because of his own self-centeredness. One of the things that I like to do to try to counter that arrogance and quick temper is to remember that everybody has a story. And when I encounter people who kind of rub me the wrong way, I have to ask myself two questions. Number one, what happened in their life that may have given them those rough edges? And probably more importantly, a self-evaluation question, why do I react so strongly to that? I have this incredible knack for uh, choosing the grocery lines that are the longest. And not too long ago, I got behind a young couple who set their stuff on the conveyor belt and divided it into four purchases, paid in four different ways, and they wanted lottery tickets. I was getting pretty irritated with how long it was taking, and uh, then I learned their story. They were actually buying groceries for their neighbors, their elderly neighbors next to them. And so when I sit back and I evaluate my attitude on that, the problem wasn't the problem. It was my attitude and my perception about the problem. Once I learned their story, my attitude changed, and I actually helped them carry out their groceries. Um, number three, Paul says a leader in the church is not supposed to be a heavy drinker. Now, this verse really doesn't have anything to do with alcohol. It has to do with when leaders cross the line and compromise their ability to lead with integrity. Paul doesn't want Titus to choose leaders who are willing to step across whatever line that is to uh, compromise what it is they do in their authentic leadership. And don't be uh, missed on this. Authenticity is really critical to the central portion of a leadership. Much of what I've learned about leadership, unfortunately, comes from sometimes not having been led well. So things like mockery, things like talking down to someone, things about um, saying one thing and doing another um, is not, does not have any place in the church, and neither does bullying as a pastor. We are not supposed to lead in the other house rule. We're not supposed to lead with, um, with any kind of sense of aggression or bullish behavior. It has no place for abuse for a leader to, uh, to tear down or to destroy another. The fifth and final house rule that Paul gives Titus is that He's supposed to be financially responsible. And it's really easy for us to uh, be greedy and to try to line our pockets whenever we get the opportunity. But Paul said there's no place for that in the church. 
In fact, he wants us to give with very open hands and to give sacrificially. Because when we do that every single week in here, we counter in battle the very tendency that we have to be greedy. And we always are in this position of, of asking God what our de desires are versus his. And giving sacrificially and giving with hands open reminds us that we are stewards of God's resources in healing the world. And I, I'm convinced that the same qualities that make for great leaders make for great Christians. Especially when you're following Jesus, the transformational process you undergo in order to become more faithful and in charge, you know, successfully of God's people is the same thing that God wants to do in ordinary, everyday people. And the best church in the world is going to be full of the best people. That's you, and you're not being found, but grown. God wants us to change. So the key question for us, whether we're just leading ourselves or leading our families or leading our business or, or, or whether we're leading you know, something bigger than that, is whether or not we're going to grow into the image of Jesus. And one key component there is that we stand for things, not against them. We've got to be people who are driven forward by a vision, God's vision of the future. Um, and so here at West Winds, one of the things that we're always trying to broadcast is that we see a church colored by love and friendship at all levels. A church that recognizes our true belongings are not our possessions, but our relationships. A church that doesn't merely promise, but also experiences laughter, joy, uh, hope, and strength. And the biblical word for all that good jazz is koinonia. It means fellowship or hospitality. And in the Bible, it's used to refer to any kind of partnership. The sexual relationship between husband and wives, business partnerships, uh, churches, small groups. I mean, really anything that puts people together. We read about koinonia in Acts 2. We read about it in Philippians 1. And the whole point again and again and again is that that's how we are God's people together. And whatever God gives to us, he wants to give through us. So what we have, we share. And what we have in abundance is this sense of love and togetherness, of friendship and family that goes beyond blood or last name or ethnicity or whatever. Now, when I think of the people who have been most hospitable to me, I think of my friend Len. This is a picture of his office where we've spent many good times arguing and bickering and laughing and horsing around. And the more time I've spent with him there, the more I've become like Jesus. I've been seasoned and trained by him, and I've caught his spirit. Consequently, if you ever go to my office here at the Winds, you'll see that there's some strong similarities. The only difference is that his weird crap costs a lot more than mine because I buy mine on eBay and he, he buys his at you know, art auctions. But the whole idea is that, is that his spirit has rubbed off on me. And that's what hospitality does. That's what leadership does. That's what followership does as we rub off on one another as we all faithfully try and serve God. And for Carmel and I especially, one of the things we always try and do is we try and love what is good? Because good things out there are good and fertile soil for the gospel to take root. So good cultural moments, good, good art, good conversation, good people, good experiences, all that stuff is like just ripe for God to do good things in it and among it and around it. Paul tells us in Titus that we're supposed to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. But it's a lot easier to hate than it is to love, and most of us need to flip that switch. We need to put all our energy into trying to love, knowing we'll be able to hate effortlessly. And love is the thing that pulls us forward. And this is especially true if you're ever in charge, in charge of a family, a business, a company, or a church. It's love that pushes us forward into the future. And leaders are people who create futures. And if you waste all your time hating on the past, you'll be stuck there. You gotta let go of the past, you gotta let go of your own hurts, and you gotta move forward into the future. This is uh, Bill Kingsbury, one of our West Winds elders, and Bill was the first man, one of our former elders, was the first man I ever admired that I had never met. But from a distance, he was an athletic, successful, energetic, wonderfully warm man. When he became one of our elders, my, my, my admiration for him only grew because he could rebuke without being offensive, and he was constantly focused on moving our church forward. The biblical word for people like Bill is sophron, and, and it means essentially he's somebody who avoids drama. He's a, a remarkable person. And, and those are the kind of leaders we want in our church. And those are the kind of people we want to be. We want to be remarkable. We want to be people of sound judgment and character. And the word for that in, in Titus is the word dikaios. And it's also the same word that we use for fertility or abundance. Because when you make good decisions, God does lots and lots and lots of good things in you. And you make better decisions by getting more deeply rooted in him. So there's this, this cycle that goes on that the more you get of God, the more God gets through you. Plato said that or something like it. 
But he used this word dikaios to talk about the four cardinal virtues. And Paul uses it throughout the New Testament to talk about the process by which we become saints. And the more our leaders benefit and make wise decisions, the more we benefit too. Uh, one of the other qualifications for leadership in Titus is godliness, which seems like a subjective term because this whack job thinks he's being godly, running around with no pants and screaming that the end is nigh. But in the Bible, godliness isn't about foolish behaviors or even extreme behaviors. It's about the process of transformation. That's what our leaders are supposed to do. That's what you and I are supposed to do. We're supposed to be changed over and over and over and over again from the people we are to the people God intends. That was the whole purpose of the covenant in the First Testament scriptures. That was the whole purpose of all the stories we have is that all of humanity and all particular humans must continually be changed. Paul tells us leaders are supposed to be self-controlled, um, which means basically that we're supposed to be not anxious. Uh, we're not supposed to be hysterical, running around like chicken little. Um, but, but if you translate his term literally, it means self-composed, M- meaning our lives are supposed to be like compositions put together for the enjoyment of God. So, so if you really want to think of a great leader, you've got to think of somebody who can enjoy godly pleasures appropriately, somebody whose life is desirable and admirable that represents the fruit of sound decision-making that honors God and, and lives well in emulation of God and Christ's character. And, and of course, my, my friend Len, he always tells me, you don't work a violin. What do you do? You, you play it. Same thing with life. You play your life. And the beauty with which you play honors God and inspires others to follow God also. Th- this is the kind of leadership we've tried to inculturate here at Westwinds. This is what we want to show. We, we, we want to be virtuous, of course, But we want to be noble, meaning we have these ambitions to work with God, to heal the world, and create better futures. And we want to be faithful. Not not, not just faithful to ideals, but but faithful to Jesus Christ and the mission of his church. And and that's what we're willing to give our life for. And that's what we want, not not only to be for you, but but we want that from you too. Amen? So how how many of you would identify by by show of hands that that you have a short attention span or or that you have some attention deficit? Yeah, if that's you, you haven't heard anything I've said so far because you just want to know why there's an elephant made of TVs up on the screen. And, and, and if you're like that, you probably feel like that's how your brain works anyways, right? Just a bunch of screens with a bunch of different stuff on it. And, and you're not really sure which thing it is you should focus on. Uh, my, my son is this way. Uh, when he was in third grade, his teachers were giving him a hard time because he wasn't paying attention in class. And, and he started to get better at it. And, and one day he told me his secret. He said, Dad, if, if I just look and nod and go like this, I can think about anything I want in my head. I told him, I said, dude, you are so ready to be a husband, man. <laughs> So, so Paul comes to Titus here and he says, if, if, if we're going to develop leaders or if we're going to be leaders, we have to be the kind of people who are focused on the message of Jesus because there's a lot of other stuff that competes for our attention. And I, and I think the same thing that was true back then that is, is probably true for us today now. Our, our lives are a little bit like this chalkboard in the picture and that there's all kinds of stuff that we have to think about and that we have to do. The world moves very quickly. And if we are going to lift Jesus up, if we're going to pay attention to the reliable message of Jesus, then that's something we have to do intentionally. I mean, we have to figure out how to keep him front and center in our lives. And the only way we will do that is if we're intentional. Because if we don't prioritize and if we're not intentional, uh, Jesus will move off to the perif or he will slide down the list somewhere. So Paul is encouraging Titus to tell his leaders to lift Jesus high and and be intentional about prioritizing him. And, And you prioritize Jesus the same way that you prioritize anything else. Here's the formula. Time plus resource equals priority. You want to prioritize golf? You want to prioritize your job, your family? You do it by spending time doing it and by investing your resources in it. So if we want to invest in and prioritize the mission of God in the world, we do it with our time and with our money. So so Paul says that this mission, this message that we're supposed to pay attention to is reliable. That's a specific word he uses. So this is his way of making sure that Titus knows that this isn't a message that he will invest in or a person he will invest in only to find out he invested in the wrong thing. We can have confidence in the message of God. And the reason we can have confidence is because we trust the messenger. Because, as you can tell by the picture, if the messenger is weird, then you're probably not going to trust what they have to offer you. But for us, we understand that the messenger is God himself. And so because we trust the messenger, 
We can believe the message is reliable. Uh, here's how this works for me. Every once in a while, one of my friends uh, will come to me and they will challenge me on something that I'm doing. They'll say, hey, you're being dumb in this area and, and you don't see it. My first instinct whenever that happens is this. I want to fight them. I want to arm wrestle them for money to prove that I'm right. But the way that I fix that is I stop and I go, well, do I trust the messenger? Because if I trust the person who's saying it to me, then I trust the message. Now, here's why this matters to us. Because much like this picture, there are things in the Bible that we will look at and we'll go, wait, wait a minute. Am I sure that that is true? Am I sure that I can trust what is being said? The Bible asks us to do all kinds of things that are countercultural and that are hard. And the way we overcome that is we put our faith and trust in the messenger so we can believe in the message. This is the key to being an obedient Christian, to getting everything out of life that God offers, is we hold on to him first, and then whatever it is that he asks us to do, we do it. We trust the message because we believe in the messenger. And this is what Paul is asking Titus to do. He says that, that he wants him to remember uh, how it is exactly that he will share this message out with other people in the world. And so it's important to understand that once we've made a decision to do that, once we've decided that the message is reliable and we trust the messenger, then we can share it out with other people. And there's a couple different ways that Paul says that we can do this to help build the church. Uh, the first is he says we can encourage one another. We can encourage each other uh, with the hope that is found in the gospel. Look, we know that the world is a scary, messed up, complicated place. Everyone we know is struggling with something somewhere. And so we have the opportunity to come alongside of them with the hope of Jesus, the hope found in the message. But we can only do it if we have it for ourselves first. Otherwise, we're like the blind leading the blind. So we have to make sure that before we're inviting other people to experience the hope of Jesus, that we know it for ourselves. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, my grandmother passed away. And so I went to the funeral in, in Pennsylvania, and when I got to the funeral, my grandma's the lady in the blue dress on the end there, and when I got to the funeral, I realized that no one had planned a funeral. No one really knew what was going on, and they all kind of looked at me and said, well, you're a pastor, right? You know what to say. And I was certainly glad in that moment that I actually did know some of the promises of God for myself, because that's what allowed me to share them out with other people. And, and, and maybe you hear me tell that story and go, well, then I'm sunk because I don't know anything about what the Bible says. Oh, well, here's a good motivation for you to start learning it. Because the more that you read the Bible, the more you will see the promises of God, and the more you can share them with other people. So Paul's second reason, first one is encouragement, his second reason for, for this, or a way that we can build the church when we know the message and pay attention to it, is that we can call out the stuff that's made up. In Paul's world, there was a whole bunch of false teaching and things that were being said that were complete nonsense. And so Paul says to Titus, you've got to fix this stuff. You've got to call out the things that you see that aren't true. And, and, and I think the same thing is true for us in our world today. Uh, we are surrounded by fake news, but the gospel gives us good news. And if we don't know the good news, we're never going to be able to identify what's true and helpful and, and, and what isn't. So we have to be the kind of people who know the good news so that we can speak against the fake news. And this is actually one of the things that we want our people at Westwinds to do, our owners in specific. If you're an owner, uh, we, we often use the language that we want you to be protecting the church. That means that you know the good news of Jesus and are paying attention to it enough that you can encourage people and that you can speak against things that just aren't true. And, and look, David and I have committed our lives to doing this, our staff as well. We've committed to paying attention to the message so we can encourage you and so we can call out the stuff that's made up. But here's the deal. We would love to do this with you, not just for you. Westwinds will be its strongest church when we have an army of people who are paying attention to the message so we can encourage each other, and so we can call out the things that aren't helpful and that aren't true. So let's commit to doing this together, yeah?